Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 354 for Monday, August 15th, 2022. Folks, and welcome to or welcome back to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, I'm Paul Kent. Paul, it's good to hear your voice, man. Ah, uh, funny, 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 funny. <laughs> you know, if if there was going to be one episode where there was scheduling confusion, last week's was perfect because it was an interview. Obviously, we did it with Bruce Hilton uh, from Being Petty, the Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers tribute experience. And if you didn't listen, I it was I, uh, Bruce was a fascinating guy to listen to, folks. So go back and, and listen to that. But it was an interview I had prepped. I brought Bruce in. So it like, I, you know, if you're going to leave me hanging, that's the way to do it. So, <laughs> well, I'm sorry to leave you hanging. And thank, <laughs> thanks for putting it so delicately. But, you know, I, I'm a huge Petty fan, so that, I know. that would have been that would have been a conversation I would have wanted. So sorry to Bruce, sorry to you. I owe you. <laughs> so I guess I'll just have to line up a, a Rush tribute band, and I'll have to do it myself. All right? Uh, yeah, no, I'll be here for that. That's fine. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. You know what? First time in seven and a half, almost eight years that that's happened. Right? Yeah. The funny part, folks, is that we were gonna record on Monday night. And then you, without, I mean, you eventually you told me, but before you told me that you had to move from Monday to Sunday, you were the one that actually moved it on our shared calendar. So when you weren't here, it's like, wait, how does this happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love it. And, and the way that the way that it happens is, is the thing that I moved it for was on the calendar. Right. And so when I kind of woke up Monday morning, you know, or when it's over the weekend, Sunday, yeah. I like, Oh, it's on Monday night. Right. It's, right. it's going to be Monday Just night. Where it is. So That's I right. went and got, I went and got busy Sunday night and, but <laughs> no, it happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you have, you've banked a little bit of uh, ability to kind of chide me for a while. Oh, it's I, fine. I that. No, like I said, it worked out. It, uh, you know, I, it, it was fine. Well, don't get fine. used to it, bud. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get used to it. Let's put it that way. I do want to get used to, uh, Releasing videos like we did in in the band that I'm in, Bitter Pill, we released our our Jesus Gonna Pay My Tab video over the weekend, and uh, that's the one we recorded at the Stone Church uh, on July 2nd. It came together. It came together fast. Like I did not expect Harry McCoy to to finish all the production that quickly. But man, I am so proud of this thing. And I mean, you know, all I played drums on the record, obviously, uh, and I I mimed drums in the in the video. But other than that, uh, I you know I was not in charge of filming or anything. And uh, or the world is all about video, isn't it? I mean, it really, literally, it, it it's like people. Yeah, it, it's all video. I mean, yeah. your your demos have to be video and yeah. good video, and an audio video. Pro you're at a disadvantage if you only have an audio video. An audio video. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Like we do for I'm this sorry, show. I'm sorry, an audio demo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with that. I mean, yeah. you got to show people. Being good at what video. Doing. Yeah. But this video no, the, is, have you watched it yet? Have you, have you seen the, not. oh man, I, like I, uh, um, John McCormick, our, our guitar player was the one who wrote the tune. And I, I think the conception of the video was, was his, I mean, it's, it's a it's a screenplay to go along with the song. It's not just a video. It's it really is just I I love it, man. I'm I'm super happy with how it came out and I'm stoked to have been a part of it. So yeah, it's it's good. It's good. I'm gonna check it out while we're while we're doing this show, actually. That sounds great. That you'd be yeah. equally as attentive as you were last week, right? So that works fine. It's very Sorry. funny. Sorry. Can't yeah. It. yeah. Hey, we All um right. we played a really important fling gig on Saturday. We, it was our first, it was not our first gig with uh, Jamie Bradley, our new bass player, but it was our first gig where we were like, we were the only band at the show. We were doing our own sound. Now, thankfully it was 75 minutes away over in Brookline, New Hampshire. We had a lot of kinks to potentially work out. We, it was the first time fling was using my new mixer that I got last year. 
Uh, like I said, it was our really kind of our first gig with Jamie where we had two sets to play and it was for an event that the town was having, but it was fairly low stakes. And if we had really done terribly, which we didn't, everything worked out fine. Uh, you know, we can, we, we could have just never gone to that town again. Um, we're glad that it worked out and, and hopefully they'll invite us back. Everything went well, but it was, it was such a, a learning experience for the band. I think. I think it was the first rock gig that three of the five of us had ever done on in ears. And so that's a whole different thing for people to, to figure out how, what, what they want in their mix because live is very different from the rehearsal room, uh, you know, and just fi- kind of finding that sweet spot for everybody and, and maintaining the onstage interaction, which can get really detached when when you're on in ears especially yeah. as you're as you're adapting to them so that that kind of that whole thing uh happened on saturday and it was it was fantastic it really it went well so um that's cool yeah it was a weird it it was the first gig i'm pretty sure that this is true the first gig i've ever played in my life where there really were no bathrooms for us to use <laughs> I don't know how this all came together, but there were no bathrooms for anybody to use. It was at a school, but we were outside and uh, yeah, it's a long story, but like, yeah, no bathrooms for us to use. What'd you do? Well, I, I certainly would never have gone into the woods and exposed myself on school grounds. Would I, because that's That's pretty smart. That's the kind of thing that you get one of those pieces of paper that says you can't be within 500 feet of a school. And uh, I don't need that. So certainly that's not what I did. Certainly not. That's right. I, no, you wouldn't do that. No, no. Neither did anybody else in the band. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. We asked him. We're like, well, where do we pee? The, the guy's like, oh, Dunkin' Donuts, which is like a mile down the road. And we're like, oh, oh my God. <laughs> and, and then it was like, oh, wait, you're not kidding. What? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's bananas. Man. It's bananas. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I've never. I, it, it, hey, there's a first time for everything. Right. I don't know. I, it's better than playing backline roulette, I guess, which is another favorite term of mine that I learned this week from someone. What's that mean? Backline roulette. When they say, oh yeah, we have a backline here. We got amps and drums. Oh. You guys can use whatever you want. And, and you show up and, and you get what backline roulette has dealt to you. <laughs> Sometimes That's it's funny. amazing. Sometimes it's not so good. It was always amazing when Dave Hamilton was providing the backline for the Mac World All-Star game, All-Star band. Well, top notch stuff. Yeah, well, that's because that's because I rented it from SIR to be top notch stuff. We had sponsors yeah. that paid for that and all the drinks. So yeah, that was our that was our gift to ourselves was having the backline we wanted to play on. Why wouldn't we? Yeah, yeah. That I mean, was it, cool. it cost me like two grand for the night to rent all that stuff. I think, but it was well worth. I, it. I got to try some really cool vintage amps though, so it was really <laughs> it was always See, fun for me. That's great. Yeah, I, I would always pick out like you know the drum set that I wanted to check out and. Uh, and all of that. Why not? Like, I mean, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is a handy thing. And SIR studio instrument rentals, I think is what SIR stands for. Great company to work with. Uh, and they are in, I think most major cities. Uh, we, we used them in Boston for sure. Obviously we used them in San Francisco. Um, but, but they're, they're, they're all over the country and they're, they're great to work with. And it was so nice having those guys bring, they would bring the gear up the stairs before the gig and down the stairs after the gig. That was a wonderful, mm. <laughs> to me, that was the that's, best that's part. That's really the best part of the service. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's the best part. Yeah, man. Yeah. How about you? How, yeah, played, what, how many gigs you play this weekend? I had five gigs. Wow. I had a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So I want to tell you about them. So Wednesday I did just a, a one hour opening acoustic set at a pretty big outdoor venue. Totally fun. Great sound guy. Easy peasy. Done. Done. Played five to six. Done. Then we went down to the beach and played for about 2,000 people nice. uh, at a really nice place, you know, that does a summer concert series on the, right on the sand. And the nice thing was we'd played it many years before. No stage, just kind of like some plywood down on the sand. Everything gets full of sand. It was of horrible. Actually yeah. built a really nice stage this year. And so that was great. And then the next night we played a concert series that was also, you know, probably about 1,700, 2,000 people and a uh, big, beautiful stage. And we, you know, the guys who are really, the guys who are really good entertainers in our band love to just, you know, 
walk that stage and play the different different parts of it and get the audience going. So that, that was kind of a fun one. And then the, the Saturday night was a, another concert in the Park Series about an hour and 15 minutes away um, that we get invited to about every three or four years. And we crushed it. It, it was one of those things that was clearly the benefit of three nights in a row, right? Each each gig was good, but each gig was better by 20% than the one before. And the, the Saturday night one, we really crushed. I mean, it was... The, people come and eat. when we get there, there's probably seven, eight hundred lawn chairs set out of people saving their spaces, right? Oh wow, that's and, great! Yeah, and it, and they start the night. It's kind of a weird setup. They start the night, everybody's in their chairs. The areas that they have set up for dancing are literally to the left and right of the band, so not right in front of us, right? So people get up as as the you know as the evening gets looser. But by the end of the night, that feeling when you've got Everyone who was in a seat, out of a seat, that was pretty cool. I mean, you know, literally everybody was standing up and partying. And it was, it was pretty great. And then I hadn't done five nights, five days in a row, and I did a uh-huh. so that gig ended about ten at night, and I had a noon, noon to three acoustic gig on on uh, Sunday, and uh, I had no idea. But I've been doing so much voice work lately, like warm ups, warm downs. I bought this thing called the breather voice, which is a, um, it's about 60 bucks and it's basically like an exercise tool for your diaphragm, right? You, really? you know, it is, yeah, there's like an app and it's just, uh, literally it, it just provides some resistance for inhaling and exhaling. And it's like a, a, a monitored thing. And I would say I've been doing it about 22 days in a row. I've felt some, you know, better breath control than I've had, you know, previously. So that was helpful. By the way, oh, your where, video where is did really you, good. Wh- I'm sorry. What's that, Paul? Your video is really good. <laughs> Are you watching it seriously yeah. while we're doing it? I'm this? watching, yeah. Yeah. The guy playing Jesus is hysterical. That's our friend Christian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He he yeah, it's great. It's great. It's uh it's fine work. Super funny that you got it running in the yeah. background. <laughs> so where did you get this breather voice thing? That's it. I want to make sure to tell just, people about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was the magic of Facebook. It kind of showed up and um, you know, they have one that's just like for for people with respiratory issues. And then there's one that's, you know, for voice, I'm not exactly sure what the difference is between the two, but then you read the comments and you try and filter out how many comments are the company, yes. you know, seating themselves for it. And, you know, it seems like enough people with technical knowledge of singing were endorsing it. And like I said, it was 60 bucks. Or 60 bucks. Like that. Okay. So you're not, it's not like you spent 500 bucks on this thing or whatever. No, oh. no, 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 no. Oh. You know, and, uh, and there's an app and the app kind of guides you through the exercises and has a bunch of videos and proper breathing techniques and that type of thing. And again, you know, you know, I've often said this, singing is not a far cry from golf to me. There are, you know, those people who walk up to a golf ball and just can hit it straight as a matter of their, their mechanics just work. It makes sense to them how to hit a golf ball. Sure. Most people slice, you know, or, or hook, right? Same thing with singing. Some people just open their mouth and genius comes out, but most people have to really work and practice at proper mechanics in order to, you know, sing correctly, not blow out your voice, maintain tone, maintain pitch, all the, all sure. that type of stuff. So, yeah. so, so this is something that, you know, breath control is the basics of singing. So it, 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 I think it has helped, right? I can feel more strength in my, in the amount of air I take in and in the controlled way I exhale, you know, as I'm singing. So it, I don't know if it's psychosomatic, but it feels as though it, it is having an effect. Sure. Well, I mean, it, it, there there likely is some psychosomatic element of it. I, I would call that more uh, building confidence, right? You, you know, you know that you're working on something, and so you are more likely to trust that, you know, that, that you've got some ability there, right? I, I certainly find that if I am spending time on the drum pad or whatever, working on like different stickings and just kind of making my brain do different things – I get yeah. more confident on the gig to to do those things because I've been doing them right, and so sure. like at some level that makes sense for you know for singing too. But also you are exercising your lungs, yeah. And so even if the well, thing, your diaphragm, it, you're right, exactly, yeah, yeah. So I I think I think there's I think it's probably there's probably something more to it than just. You know. And I'll tell you, I just sang five days in a row, and and as I'm singing all of those five days, I'm very conscious about the mechanics of you know taking yeah. the air in 
and pushing it out. So if nothing else, it's got me thinking about the mechanics of it. And um, I got through five days, you know, one hour set on Wednesday, three hour set Thursday, Friday, Saturday, three hour set Sunday, and and you know, a lot of singing. And I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. And Sunday was really a joy. So that was kind of a cool thing. So yeah, they were all good. It's an interesting thing. I, I want to ask you about your gigs, but I want to bring up a kind of an interesting topic. You know, I, as I've been sharing, the band is different. I have two rhythm guys. One guy just celebrated his one year anniversary, and then we've been breaking up, breaking in, breaking up, breaking in a new drummer this year. Right. And he's he's a very good drummer. He's a you know technically a very good drummer. But our way of doing things, there's just a lot of unique things that we do and we want to hear. Sure. And I was thinking today, he's like the nicest guy in the world and a very good, and he's very, very open to input. But it's been my experience that not all musicians are open to input. A lot of musicians like, dude, you hired me to play bass. I'm going to play bass. You hired me to, you know, to, to strum a guitar. I'm going to give you me, you know, don't, don't, don't tell me how to play my instrument. You, you, you know, the type of feedback, you ever hear that kind of conversation between musicians in a band? Yeah, I, I, I've run into it. There's two to me, there's there's two different things, and I'll say right out front, I don't think there's anything wrong with either of these things, right? But there's the, let me show you how to play your instrument, and 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 that's one thing. And if there's something to be learned and something to be taught or shared, like that, there's nothing wrong with that in my book. And then the other thing is, let me show you what I am thinking of for this part for this song. And those are two different things. They they both encom- yeah. they are both encompassed in the I play you know the drums or I play a guitar or whatever because not only are you executing on the parts which is the sort of more technical side of it there is the the crafting side where you are crafting the parts and coming up with either the fills or or this that and the other thing but like I I'm I don't know I I have found that most great ideas come from collaboration. And in fact, I was telling a friend of mine, uh, my friend Julius listened to our latest bitter pill record, live in a free dying ain't cheap uh, recently. And I saw him the day that he listened to, he's like, I listened to your record today. I was like, Oh, well, thanks man. He's like, and and we started talking about tunes and he, he mentioned this one song um, come set on the porch a spell. He's like that on first listen, that's really, you know, that was my favorite. I'm like, oh, yeah, I love that tune. It's a departure. It's a different kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, we started talking about how it on first listen, it both reminded us of Steely Dan. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, you know, I thought the song would just like kind of keep going. And I like the vibe of it. He's like, but then you get to that that bridge where you go into the halftime and then you shift to double time and it changes everything about the song and it really propels it. And I I 100 percent agree with him. It's a great idea. And I'm so happy that our guitar player, John, had the idea to suggest to me that I do exactly what you hear on the record. Uh, it was not my idea, you know, It and it, it was 100% the benefit of us sitting here in my studio a month before we went into the studio, working through these tunes and intentionally sort of trying out different ideas. There were, there were a bunch of ideas that we tried out that just stayed here. You know, it just didn't work, but some of them were great ideas and they did, they worked, they stuck. And that was one of them. And it was, I was so great to hear how happy, you know, uh, a, a friend of mine whose ear I trust and all of that just really loved it. And, and I was also like super happy to, to tell him that it wasn't my, it didn't need to be my idea. You know, it, it's, it's the band's idea and, and, or sometimes like in the studio, it's our producer's idea. Cause there were some things that absolutely were Chris's idea when we were recording. And yeah. I like that. I like, I have, there's no, I mean, there's some stuff that I come up with that sticks and I'm proud of that too, but I, I'm equally proud of just a good product. It doesn't all have to be my idea. And, and in fact, let me make it clear. If it were a hundred percent up to me, the product wouldn't be as good. Mm. And I think that's true of, I think we could say that about everybody in the band. Like if it, if it was just one vision, it, it wouldn't be as good. So when someone is driving the vision and has that vision on something, 
I, you know, I, I like to listen to them. I mean, we'll try it sometimes. And like I said, sometimes it's just like falls apart. And it's like, oh, well, yeah, that didn't work. That was a terrible idea. <laughs> but yeah. you, you have to you have to enter those things with as objective a mind as is possible. And it's not the easiest thing in the world to be objective when someone is saying, hey, that thing you're playing, try something different. Right. Because it that can easily be a blow to your to your ego. Right. Like you aren't making the best decision here. I know better. That's one way to interpret that. The other way is you had a different idea. Something inspired you. Maybe it was what I was playing inspired you to come up with it. Or maybe it was something completely different. But like, to me, that like the whole collaboration thing, that, that's that's where it's at. So, I, I mean, it's and, it, you know, I say this. And make it sound like I'm always able to be objective. I'm not. There are definitely times, and probably in the last year, there's been a handful of them where somebody suggested something. It's like, freaking guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Telling me how to play the drums, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that's the, <laughs> the inner monologue that goes on. But I try it, you know, because I've learned, let that, let that voice, like, shut that voice up for just a minute. Try it. If it sucks, then tell the guy it sucks. <laughs> you know, but at least... Prove that it sucks. Don't just assume that it's going to suck. Sure. Well, you know, um, it's like many conversations that we have here about what is the vibe of your band? I yeah. mean, are you communicative? Are you in a bunch of individuals? Are you know? And so I don't know that there's a right or wrong. I, d I definitely know that I've played music often with musicians who clearly playing music is their one space in life where nobody can tell them what to do. Oh. You know? Do you, can you imagine the vibe that I'm kind of sharing with you? Like, yeah. like music, music is their escape and it's not the collaborative part of music. It is getting into their craft and getting into their own headspace about things. And they can be very, very good. Music. They may be bad collaborators, but there could be very, very good musicians. Um, or, and again, it's all shades of gray, you know, right, they can right. be yeah. okay collaborators and okay musicians, or they can be, you know, anything in between. So I've, I've encountered that type of person before. And the reason this comes up to me is because I'm talking about my buddy, Don, who is a excellent drummer. I'm giving him a lot of direction for things. Sure. And he wants to, he wants to make the, he wants to fit into the band and he's been incredibly gracious in taking this direction. It dawns on me that not everybody would be yeah. that incredibly, yeah. you know, I have, I have a, um, well, yeah, when you're stepping, thing. when you're stepping into a band like he is, or I, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't, a, a, a ever a member of the house rockers. I just showed up to sub in those scenarios. Honorary member. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, but I, you know, when I, when I came in, it was like, I need to learn, you know, I'm one guy and there's nine other people that know how these songs go. And you know what I always say, you know, being right is a consensus. And so it's like, well, the consensus is always on the other side of me. So because uh, I'm one and they are nine. So I need to learn what those nine think is right, Ooh. except for the intro to drive my car, which your band like totally like <laughs> foobar because like you can't do that wrong. But I mean, come on. Um so I guess I'm a dick sometimes. It's fine. But, uh, but, but, you know, when you come into a band, step one is finding how to get up to speed quickly. And generally that means, you know, maybe jotting your ideas down to present a few months later, uh, unless there's just something that it is, that is going terribly wrong. But yeah. otherwise, yeah, you just learn how they do it. And then maybe the new songs, of course, you're more a part of the, the arrangement process, if it's a cover band or, you know, maybe the writing process, if it, you know, depending on how that works. But, uh, but yeah, you gotta, you gotta get up to speed if it's, if you're stepping into a previously filled role. Well, or, you, or you're going to find out right there and then whether it's a good fit for you and your bandmates. So whether they're like, dude, you do you, or whether they're like, no dude, we like it this way. That's, yeah. That's a huge tell into what your relationship with the band is going to be like. That's true. You know, with drummers, I actually, you know, I didn't do this with us at the Macro All Star Band because that was, that was to be a, you know, show up and have fun type of thing. But the house rockers I'm actually quite particular about. And there's, um, I just want to call it like a sense for dramatics that I, I really love in a, in a drummer. Like, like we will impromptu, 
you know, break a song down and I'll introduce the band sure. or introduce a song and, or, or, you know, would like a drummer to intuit- intuitively feel as I want to do a build somewhere yeah. or do a hit somewhere, all these types of things. And I, again, I call it, I call it a sense of dr- dramatics that, you know, when I have a vibe with a drummer and my buddy Joe, he and I listened to the same music and went to the same concerts and had the same vibe, you know, growing up. And it was almost intuitive. I mean, it was literally, I had that type of relationship yeah. with Joe. Yeah. It's been different with the other guys who have drummed in the house. It's different with you as well. I don't, but again, when you and I have played together, it's never been, it's never been a big expectation, but you have, you have big ears and you know, you, you're ready for that type of stuff. Other drummers, other bands don't do that. You play the song from beginning to end and you know, a detour is a very foreign concept, right? Yeah. But you know, to me that, you know, I, I'm more about the improvisation of the performance as I am about the improv- improvisation of the song. Oh, same. I mean, to me, that's the, and perhaps this is why we enjoyed playing music together so much is uh, like, I, I live for those moments on stage when the communication starts happening mid song. Right. And, and sometimes it can be the result of a, of a, you know, a train wreck, (laughs) but other times it can be, look, you know, whoever the front person is starts taking things in a direction or whoever, even, even if it's just a soloist, right. You know, whoever has the baton for whatever reason, and I, that's kind of what I think of it as, right. Is, you know, in a rock band, the baton gets passed around all the time, you know, so there's different soloists, maybe different singers, whatever it is, but you know, whoever's got the baton reacting to them and, and doing it well. And there is a, there is an art to that. And I've, I've done it well sometimes and I've overdone it sometimes and I've over underdone it sometimes, but yeah, that whole idea of really kind of, you know, making it happen in the moment together. That's why, I, that's why I pack my shit in the car and bring it to the gig. Like, you know, unless you hire SIR, unless you hire SIR. Yeah. That, I don't have, I don't have a $2,000 budget for every gig yet, yet, yet. We keep putting out videos like this with Bitter Pill. We're going to get there pretty soon. So pretty cool. Yeah, man. (laughs) Yeah. So I I get you. I feel you. I I don't. I'm trying to think of the last time I played with someone that was inflexible. And it, it, it ends pretty quickly when the inflexibility sets in. It doesn't always show itself right out of the gate. You know, you'll have some cat join the band and it's like, yep, I'm, I just want to be in the band and here it is. And a couple of years goes by and you realize, oh, well, th- there, there is a huge bifurcation in what this person wants to do now, whether that was what they wanted to do in the past or not. You don't know, but, you know, they want to do a very different thing now than than we're doing. And there's no interest, uh, perhaps even from either side, in finding what a collaboration would look like. And then it's just got to end like it, you know, yep. it's like you can still go have a beer together, still play different music together. But, you know, that one band, it does. If it's not working, it's not working. And and it's OK to to notice that. In fact, it's really good to notice that Yeah. <laughs> and then fix it. And and oftentimes fix it means, you know, changing the lineup. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. That happens. It's, you know, it's how it goes. It's how music works. So, um, yeah, I but I, yeah. I, I like all the, the bands that I have had that, 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 you know, have special places in my heart are bands of, of people who collaborated in, in one way or another, you know, where it's, um, it's just that. And certainly I've played in bands where I've just been like, you know, Dave Bang Drum. I'm doing, uh, they, they, they wrote me into doing Rocky Horror uh, at the theater again. And, and so we did two of those gigs, uh, this weekend, I got there were six gigs total and, you know, stay bang drum. It's fine. I like the people in the band, Jamie, our, our new bass player and fling is, is playing bass in, in Rocky. And so that's good. And my friend Dave's playing guitar. And, uh, that's where I got to see my friend Julius. Although he, he's not playing the gig because he's off to, uh, conduct and play piano one for the touring production of hairspray, which is like I'm so stoked for him. Yeah, 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 yeah. I told him, I said, I hope you and I never play a gig together in this theater again, because I hope your career goes, you know, so well and so far that that that's that. I said, but if we do, I'd happily, you know, I enjoy playing with you. But I don't, I don't want that to happen. I want his career to to take him lots of different places. But um, 
you know, it's it's just Dave Bang Drum. I'm not. It's it, the band's not even on stage, which is really weird for Rocky Horror mm -hmm. not to be like engaged with the actors and not feeling the energy of the crowd. It's it's one of those things where it's like you know, in retrospect, if I'd known all the details, I'm not sure I would have said yes, but it's fine. Like I'm doing it. I and I've had fun the first two nights, you know, so it'll be fine. It's all good. Right? Cool. Yeah, it's just, but it's but it's day bang drum. You know, it's not. But like my ideas are not necessary. Well, they were for one thing. We had a disaster to, at the end of the show on Friday night. And so I showed up on Saturday and I'm like, all right, I'm going to walk all over the hierarchical lines here because I know how this can be fixed. And this is how it can be fixed. And everybody's like, that's a great idea. I'm like, thank you. Fixed. Done. And it worked great Saturday night. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but that that was, that's an anomaly, right? Because it was a train wreck and it needed to be fixed, but. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you got to know what the gig is too. Like if it, you know, if you bring somebody in and, and you tell them like Gary did for the wedding band, right? He's like, I run the band. I pick the songs. I pick the set list. I book the gigs. I write the checks. You show up, you Dave bang drum and, you know, don't be a jackass. And, and pretty much the, you can keep the gig. And it's like, great. I understand. Yeah, no problem. Right. You know, and, I'd sit down and there'd be a five hundred dollar check on my drum stool. Okay, yeah, like that, sure. That's, that's the deal. That's the deal. See, I, I, you know me, I operate way better in that in that world. Like, if I own it, I own it. If I don't own it, I don't own it, and I, I'll follow whatever you want. Yeah. But you know, when when it's my when it's my kingdom, you know, let's deal with it. And a lot of people nod and say yes, I I I I, I willingly accept those terms, but they really don't accept those terms. Right. You know, they, they, oh. they like the idea of coming in and just, just Dave bang drums. But yeah. once they get into it, they really want to be the guy that they, you know, that, that they always are. So, so, and, and again, I, I, it's been funny. I used to, I used to not be able to grok how much clearer I could be with somebody when I offered them a, a you know, a gig and, uh, and to have it blow up, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I totally get that. I mean, Look, I'm a, I'm a control freak too, right? I, I like to make sure things are right. I like, if I think th that I have an idea that's better, I, you know, it, it eats at me if we're not doing it that way. Obviously, you know, I, I stepped all over the rules. That, that, I mean, it, nobody was upset with me about it. In fact, everybody was very thankful at the theater on Saturday when I showed up with the solution to our major train wreck problem from Friday night. But, um, but... I am so much in charge in the rest of my work life that mm. I enjoy the the I get that. escape of of just being Dave Bang Drum, right? And I, it's, get it. I, I don't. It's not my rodeo. I don't need to worry about it. I mean, when again, like when I can't understand a cue that's coming from the stage, that's up to me to understand. Well, then we, we got to fix something. And we do, yeah. but, but barring that, it's not, it's not up to me to say, oh, Hey, we should, you know, we should uh, double that chorus on this song or whatever. Like it's the, like, that's way outside the, you know, that's coloring way outside yeah. the lines. And I don't have any interest in that. It's just like, yeah, I'm just going to go play and practice some of the fills that I'm learning on my drum pad with this new Steve Gadd book I got and have some fun with, you know, off, uh, it, uh, time shifted flams and, and those things. And, uh, you know, like that's, that's what this gig is for me. And it's fine. I don't yeah. have to lug drums in and out. Cause I'm just playing George's drums. And so I show up at 11 o'clock and we downbeat at midnight and I'm out of there at one And it's like, all right, cool. And I go home and I sleep. So, but, but that I like, I enjoy that in very small doses. I'd rather be in a band that's collaborative. Um, I don't want to be the one in charge, but I like collaborating with, I don't, I don't want to be the, you know, the one who is just in charge of the whole thing. Um, uh, yeah. but I, I like collaborating. I like working together, not just on the music, but on, you know, on, on everything where it makes sense. And then there's some things you can't always have, you know, six cooks in the kitchen either though. Right. You, you got to let some things just be, you know, other people that just in the interest of progress. So, which is also, I mean, I, I've, I've learned these lessons the hard way because I've, yep, I've, your head. I've effed it up in the past. <laughs> no, I get it. I don't know. I don't know. I got one more thing for you today. Yeah, man. The great Jeff Beck is going to go on tour. Again, huh? In, in the United States. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, okay. 
playing at the MGM Music Hall at Fenway. How big a venue is that? I don't know. I've heard of this venue, and I can't figure out whether it's the old House of Blues right across the street from Fenway or if it is something else. Uh, but I've, Well, he's, he's playing about an 1,800-seat venue in San Jose, California. So. Okay, so it's probably the, the, the venue that I knew as the House of Blues, which is right across the street from All Fenway. Right. I've seen Sting yeah. there. It's about a 2,000-seater, so, yep, it's, it, it's, a, it's a great venue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Jeff Beck. Man. Yeah, man. Huh. You, know, you know, Annika Niles? Yeah. That's his drummer. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'll have to see if Jan is, is, has been asked to play with him. And, and I already know the answer to that because every time Jeff goes on the road, he asks Jan if he'll come with him. Mm. But I, I, and Jan, no, I, 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 I you have to rehearse. <laughs> Jan. But you never know. He sat in with Jeff for the final night of his last tour in the U.S. over at the Hollywood Bowl. Got it. Well, the final night of this one is up in Reno, so that's uh, probably not going to happen. That's probably, yeah, it's not a, not a, you know, it's not, it's not LA, right? So, right. yeah, yeah. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Huh. Yeah. Did you get your Springsteen tickets talking about bands going on the road? I did. I, it, we actually were going to talk about this, about the whole, you know, surge pricing ticket, but I got two. So I went and did the verified fan thing yeah, and um, got accepted. You know, they ask you for, to pick three or four or five venues that you would want to go to. You get accepted for one, basically. That's right. Yeah. Uh, I guess one per email address that you're trying to do this thing on. Right. So one per ticket master account, as I understand it. Yes. Ah, uh, there we go. Yeah. So anyway, yep. I got, um, I got tickets in Portland and my best friend, actually his daughter got tickets for us in New Jersey. So I'm going to see him twice. Nice. You know, it's an interesting thing because here's the deal. All the initial grief and disappointment because his hardcore fans, which is a, you know, I don't even know if they're actually blue collar. Maybe they're blue collar. Not at those prices, they're, but sure. Well, no, no, <laughs> but no, I'm saying they're hardcore fans are, are, you know, are a kind of a blue collar vibe largely, sure. but they're also probably 60 at least now. And <laughs> exactly. so, you know, yeah. uh, they're retired blue. Collar. So, but you know, the, all the arguments like it, it, it's what the market will bear. So if you can sell them, why not? I just think they, they really muff this in the lack of communication or, well, you know, ticket should master he, should he have kept his, should he have kept his pit pricing, you know, have some part of each venue, even if it's highly competitive for that. I mean, he just sold his catalog for five hundred million dollars, so it's a bad look. Absolutely. Oh yeah. I, and well, and he, then his manager think... came out and said There's something really stupid and and just made it worse. And so it's it's a bad situation. Is it the true market dynamics and like everything else? I mean, the Stones have been charging a lot of money for tickets for years in yep. stadiums and McCartney charges a lot of money and he kept his ticket prices down for a long time. I just think he didn't manage expectations or his his organization, which I'm sure I'm sure they they do what he says. I'm sure Correct. he may get some advice, but I just think they muffed the communication of it. Well, and, and Ticketmaster Ticketmaster took one for the team on this because because Springsteen hasn't said anything about it, which is the yeah. smartest move he could have made, right? Because yeah. without him giving anyone any sound bites, the the conversation quickly became about the dynamic pricing model that that Ticketmaster and Live Nation use, right? Where it it's it the the, the demand dictates what the price is going to be. Now, wh one thing that, that there's a, there's a lot to be said about this, and I know I, we, that we've got some some hard stops here tonight. In general, the price you pay for a ticket, a hundred percent of that goes to the artist. The fees go to Ticketmaster, right? That's basically how it works. Uh, the artist can choose to put a ceiling on the price that the dynamic, you know, on the, on whatever the dynamic engine is going to use. Right. So you can say, okay, let the dynamic engine do it, but you know, don't go above, uh, you know, whatever, 950 bucks a ticket or 500 bucks a ticket, right. you know, whatever you want it to be. Obviously they did not put a ceiling on, on the, uh, on the Springsteen tickets. And, and at some level that was approved by people either Springsteen or people in his camp that, that make these yeah. decisions with him. Right. But the other thing is 
By the time tickets go on sale, usually it's only about 10% of the venue left to sell. There are so many industry deals and pre-sales and all this stuff. Bob Left Sets has done a ton of stuff on this, not just with the Springsteen thing, but over the yeah. years, just about how Ticketmaster works. And it's fascinating because he's the only person in the industry willing to actually talk about what really happens. And so you got 90% of the tickets have already been sold to, you know, buddy deals and stub hub deals and all of those things. And then you got 10% for the, you know, for us, the, the rest of us. And when you've got a ton of demand, well, you know, the dynamic pricing. I mean, what was it? 10 years ago, you used to be able to go on to Ticketmaster's site the day before a show went on sale and see what the pricing tiers were. It was like, you know, front row or the, you know, the floor is is 250 bucks. Loge level one is 150. You know, you could see all of that. And then that, right. went, then that went away. Because well, not only went away, but at, while you're making the decision to buy, the price is changing price in your changed. hands, right? You're that's watching crazy. it literally be bid up in front of you when you think you're, that's right. you know, and, and again, it, 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 lack of communication and expectation setting, I think is the yeah. big sin here. Big time. And, yeah. you know, and you know what, if there's only 10% left of the venue left, Really? I, I mean, again, now that's that's been a, you, that's the dirty secret of Ticketmaster is like, yeah, but all I'm saying is if, if that's truly the case, why screw around with the pricing like that for 10 percent of the hall and get the grief that you're getting is the amount of money you're getting on the 10 percent of those remaining tickets worth well, worth that grief? He, I mean, Springsteen's it definitely, the first grief that we've seen at this level in a long time. Right. I mean, right. it. so so it probably it. By and large, it probably is worth it. This one, like like you said, was just mishandled uh, from from the get go. They should have just put a cap on it. I don't think yeah. they thought it would happen this way. I think they figured the algorithm would, you know, keep it in. That's that. their job is to think whether oh, it would wow. happen or not, right? Well. I mean, that's you have one job. <laughs> yeah. And then there's a story about crowded house that hey, this sucks. We didn't realize it was going to get out of hand like this refund people's, you know, overage costs. Yeah. And so, you know, you have at least one data point of a band saying this is not cool. You've got. Yeah. But, but Springsteen has to go, uh, you know, on other people's yachts right now. He wants to go on his own yacht, man. So he's got to, you know, he's got to bring he's home sold this bacon. catalog for $500 million. <laughs> yeah. I guess he can I mean, buy again, the I helicopter. Love him. And I love him more than anybody you'll ever talk to. And again, I, I, I think it's, it's sad. And you know, also that part of the fun going to Springsteen show was, how into it every fan was. Now it's how yeah. much every fan can afford it, right? It's going to yep. be, you know, I don't want to be with the wine sippers in the Springsteen show. I want to be with people who live and die for it. It's not going to be that. And so, you know. It's true. The, it's true. Yeah. No, I, you're right. Part. It's it now it's a, it, especially for this tour. It's unavoidable that having tickets, especially good seats to Springsteen on this tour is a status symbol, like, uh, you know, a, a brand name car or wearing a Rolex, yeah. or, you know, whatever it is. It's, oh yeah, I have Springsteen tickets. Like, oh, holy crap. Like, a oh, big spender, you know, <laughs> even if that's not true, but even I, if you got them through some back channel. And I would also say that the whole issue about the secondary market, you know, it makes sense. He should get the money, not the scalpers. But 100%. I work for a company now that is a data company, right? Okay. And, and, and the guy who owns my company was saying to me, you know what? I'm just really surprised that someone hasn't come up with a, you know, ticketing is not rocket science. Why, why don't someone sell a white label ticketing system where, where artists can white label the ticketing can verify fans in a meaningful way to figure out if they're fans or not. And there, you know, there's a number of ways that you could do that. you like, yeah. did they buy, did they buy, you know, off the, your bootleg series, your live series, you know, you know, questions about the artists that you have to answer in the first, you know, are they, are they, a million are they ways. buying my merch or, you know, what's the, yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, he, it was like, you know, this is a solvable problem. You know, other, you don't have to, you're not beholden to Ticketmaster. Although well, I don't you, know the, you inter, are, the Ticketmaster and Live Nation and how the, you know, the venue, the ticket system locked in the venues. That's, that's the not thing. cool. So when, is what the venues are there. There are not all of them. I mean, there's some a AXS is a big one in your area, right? That owns some venues yeah. and, and all of that, but, but nationwide. Yeah. Live nation slash Ticketmaster, They They own enough of the venues that they get to, yeah. to write this ticket, which sounds like a monopolist monopolist. Of course, monopolist it of course it is. Practice. Yeah, of course. That's exactly what it is. Monopolistic. Yeah. Monopolistic anyway. Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. 
It'll be interesting to see how this evolves. Uh, if it evolves, I don't know that it will, to be honest, Paul, I think there are going to be artists, you know, like, like crowded house and, and, and even Springsteen, if, you know, if he tours again, uh, presuming that, you know, th th things haven't dramatically changed in the world. My guess is if the system is the same as it was today, there would be a cap put in there because he doesn't need this twice. Right. You know, that for sure. But Didn't Pearl Jam like buck the system and not want to work with Ticketmaster. They tried. And it, it was such a, it was such a, you know, heartache for them yeah. that they just finally said, what the hell, this is the way it is. We'll, we'll have to deal with it. We just deal with it. Yeah. Fish was the same way. I mean, not so much fighting Ticketmaster, but they keep their ticket prices low. A big part of that, though, is, you know, there's there's the the joke in the industry is that there's, you know, there's only 80,000 fish fans. They just mostly all go to the, the shows. And so God bless them. What, what's that? God bless them. God. Well, that's the thing. But if you know that and my guess is fish knows exactly how many fans they have out there that are that are going to shows. Uh, if you know that, then you calculate what you think each of them could spend per year. And divide that by the number of shows that an average person goes to. And there's your ticket price, right? Because right. that, that's how you stay in business. <laughs> so uh, Fish's tickets are always less than 100 bucks. Well, no, 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 well that's, how, that's how Fish stays in business. But, you know, Correct. Springsteen, Springsteen had a choice, different. right? That Springsteen's yeah. different. Abs oh, no, I don't. I, yeah, most bands couldn't afford to do what Fish does because, it, it, you know, most bands, people are going to see them once per tour. Right. And so, you know, you're putting on the same show every night, mostly, you know, you're going from town to town, you're putting on a show, you're not just doing this, this different thing. But I mean, I, my guess is that Springsteen has, you know, 10 or 100 times the, the number of fans that Fish does. Uh, and so that you like, it, it's a whole different thing. It's, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm, I don't have a problem with it. Um, I just no, no. He deserves the money that yeah. he just should have got out in front of it. He just he yeah. made a lot of people feel bad. Who correct? Were, like in you know, six years, yeah. People were like, "I need this." I mean, people who were there, you know, for all his price. It, market dynamics is one part of it, but you know, again, it's a bad look after you just sold your catalog for five hundred million. It's <laughs> Half not, a billion. It's not yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not like. And again, he deserves the money, not the secondary market, you know, deserves totally. the money, right? And clearly the fans are willing to pay it. Some subset of yep. them are willing to pay it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have heard about $4,000 tickets because they wouldn't have sold. Right. So, yep. But the $750 Ticketmaster fee on a $4,000 ticket is a pretty bad look for everybody. It's a, that's, I agree. Yeah, I agree. It costs them absolutely no more to service that ticket purchase. That's right? correct. That's, you're exactly right. Yeah, no, the, the Ticketmaster fee... The fact that that is variable as well is, I mean, no part of it is good, but that, yeah, you're right. That's a bad look. <laughs> Dick. Yeah. Oh, well. All right. All right. Well, it was good to rant about that. You got anything else, yeah. man? No, now I'm sad. I'm going to go have dinner. Okay. Well, enjoy dinner. Thanks, Thanks for man. hanging out with us, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. Always be performing. That's it. Even if the ticket's four grand. In fact, especially... Especially. <laughs> <laughs>